I've been enjoying using the Amstrad CPC again, and I have it here connected to this Amstrad monochrome CRT, but unfortunately it has a few problems. The first one is the 12 volt power supply coming from the monitor that is used for the floppy disk. And without that power supply... The next one are the monitor dials. If you touch the brightness dial, you get this weird interference pattern all over the screen. And the final one, and this is not something I may be able to fix right now, is that if you look really, really closely, there's a slight jitter on the screen up and down. So let's take it to the lab and have a look at it there. First of all, for those not familiar with the Amstrad CPC, it may sound odd to talk about a monitor generating a power supply used by external devices, in this case, the computer. But that's the way that Amstrad designed them on purpose because every Amstrad CPC came bundled with a monitor, whether it was the green monitor, the monochrome monitor like this one, or a color monitor. Every monitor doubled both as a TV and a power supply to the Amstrad. In this case, that's what these cables are. This is the video cable that goes into the Amstrad CPC. And then this one is the five volt power supply that goes into the Amstrad, and that's a standard barrel jack. However, sometime after the 464, Amstrad released the Amstrad 6128 and actually the 664, that both of them had a floppy disk drive that required 12 volt power supply. So what they did is they released another version of the monitors that includes a 12 volt power supply right here. Fortunately, they did the right thing. And this is a female connector, whereas the five volt power supply is a male DC jack. So it's impossible to confuse which one goes where. Unfortunately, on this particular monitor, the 12 volt power supply seems not to be working, or at least when I connected a computer to it, the floppy disk drive wasn't working. So let's start investigating what's going on there. So what I want to do, first of all, is make sure that we have 12 volt or we don't have 12 volt or, or see what's going on in there. But I can't just probe it there. It would just short things. Instead, I'm going to introduce this male barrel jack and test the connection in the back. I believe that this one is center negative, but it doesn't really matter. Right now, I just want to see if we get anything. And it looks like we don't. Yeah, so as I suspected, the 12 volt power supply there is completely dead. Let's open up the monitor and have a look. The case is held together with just four screws. So once we remove them, it opens right up. And it looks like it's really dusty there, but nothing looks damaged, so that's great. Also here, you can see that Amstrad did use Orion tubes for their monitors, which I guess they were not the best, but they were reasonably good ones. Before we can work on the monitor, we need to make sure that it's fully discharged. The tube can be charged with up to 30 to 40,000 volts, and even more in the case of bigger monitors. So it's something you need to be really careful about. To be fair, I suspect that a smaller CRT like this one may not have enough charge to be really dangerous, but at least it would be a nasty shock. In any case, when it comes to my health, I like to earn the side of extra caution. I do that with woodworking, always wearing like eye breathing and hearing masks. And when it comes to resin 3D printing, like we'll see in a couple of weeks, or when it comes to discharging a monitor. The method you see in a lot of YouTube videos is to take a long screwdriver, attach an alligator clip to the screwdriver and to ground, and poke the anode with a conductive end. This works and is mostly safe, but it has a few problems. The biggest drawback of this approach is that electricity could arc over the screwdriver handle to your hand. That's probably pretty unlikely, assuming you're not barefoot standing on a puddle of water, but you can improve on that by having a screwdriver with a well-insulated handle and maybe insulating some of this part as well and grabbing it as far back as possible. Another problem with this is that the discharge is instant since you're shorting the two leads of a huge capacitor, so it can spark a discharge with a lot of current at once which can put some stress on the components. So enter the high voltage probe. At its core, yeah, this is pretty similar to the screwdriver contraption, but with a few extra safety features. The most obvious one is all the insulation covering it. This is very nice plastic and it goes pretty much all the way to the tip. So there's no chance at all that it's going to arc over to your hand. The next one is that there is a big resistor inside the probe. The main purpose of that is to serve as a voltage divider, but it will also help discharge the CRT a bit more slowly instead of all at once, so it won't be stressing out any components. Finally, this probe lets you actually measure the existing voltage. So you can connect this to a voltage meter and it will tell you how much voltage there is at the tip, but divided by a big factor, probably something like a thousand. That is not essential, but it's very nice to verify that the CRT is fully discharged before starting to touch it. So anyway, 
Let's put it in action. I have the probe plugged into the voltage meter. That way we may be able to see what the CRT is charged to. Although a lot of the times monitors are already discharged by the time you get around to servicing them, so we'll see. While I'm doing this, I'm keeping my other hand behind me just to accidentally avoid touching anything. The tip isn't flat like a screwdriver, so it's actually a little bit more challenging to put it under the protective rubber. But with a bit of careful pushing around, there it goes. And I feel it making contact with the metal end of the anode. I didn't see any meaningful voltage reading or heard any discharge, so it was already probably fine. Still, these kind of things, much better safe than sorry. I'm actually going to put it away for a few minutes and then come back and do it again just to be really sure. And the second time around, yeah, I'm definitely touching metal and there's no charge in there, so I think it's all safe now. So let's pop it out by hand. Yeah, there you go. I'm gonna take a break and go for a walk in this beautiful November morning. It's a little chilly. It's uh, right under freezing, I think, right now. So yeah, I'm kind of bundled up. But I wanted to thank all the channel supporters up in Patreon and YouTube, as well as today's video sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay is a great service. They make PCB boards for you. They're a fantastic service to prototype your own designs. They also offer assembly, which is a great option if you're distributing your board to lots of people. So if you're interested at all, definitely check out their website at pcbway.com. And now I'll see you when I get back. Well, that was a great run. So let me get in the shower and let's get back to that monitor. Before I take the board out, I'd like to do a quick inspection. The board looks pretty standard, a couple of voltage regulators with massive heat sinks up there. I do remember these monitors running pretty hot after several hours of operation though. There's another one over there. Wait, oh wait, is this for real? It looks like half of the body of the regulator is missing. And I might even see some charring or something like that in some of the metal that I've spoken through. That doesn't look good at all. And now that I realize it, this is right behind the connector for the 12 volt output. So chances are this is a 7812 and that's probably the reason we're not getting any voltage from there. Could it be this easy? I need to confirm that with the schematic, but that's looking very likely. These are the schematics for the monitor, taken straight from the Amstrad service manual. It may look intimidating at first, but it's not too bad. Let's follow the AC voltage input. On the left, we have the transformer that converts 220 AC volts to a couple of smaller voltages. Then we have some bridge rectifiers that generate a DC voltage from there. Interestingly, some of the nodes are even labeled with the voltage that's expected there, so that's very useful. And then we have a couple power transistors. I suspect those are the ones with the massive heat sinks we saw earlier. It looks like one generates five volts and the other one 12 volts. The five volt one seems to just go to the output jack for the computer and the 12 volt goes to the rest of the board. It's actually very typical for these kind of monochrome monitors to run on 12 volts. But if the monitor was running, then how come the output jack didn't have 12 volts on it? If you look further down below, you'll see that the output jack was fed by none other than a 7812 voltage regulator like I suspected earlier. So even though it also runs on 12 volts, it's kept completely separate from the rest of the system to minimize any kind of crossover interference. While we're here, we can also see that the video signal input on the left and then the adjustable resistance of brightness, contrast, and vertical sync, which correspond to the dials in front. Before we do anything else though, I want to clean up all that dust accumulated inside, so I'm more comfortable working there. I'm going to take it outside and blast it with my air compressor. And yes, I'm even going to wear a mask while I do that because it will probably kick up a crazy amount of dust in the air. And yeah, that didn't seem to do too much. Let me check. Oh wow, all the dust is still coating the inside of the monitor. It's just stuck more firmly than I realized. I guess I'll have to remove it the old fashioned way with soap and water. Back inside we go. First, I'll finish disconnecting the cables so I have a better access to the board. The defective 12 volt regular has its own little board in here, which makes sense because this was added as a second revision of this monitor. Let's take it out and have a look at it. There are no obvious burn spots, but that still doesn't look good at all. Let's try continuity. And oh wow, two of the leads are shorted. Like that, for sure, it wasn't going to work. I want to have a better look at it, so checking under the microscope, it just shows that it's really destroyed, so I'm not surprised at all that it's not working. Okay, time to desolder it and put a new one. Since this is just three terminals, I'll use the old-fashioned solder sucker pump. And then I'll add a new 7812, screw it in place, and solder it. 
Okay, this is looking much better. Now let's take out the main board. There's some cables that can be easily unplugged, so I won't remove it all the way, but this is good enough to work on it. The first thing I wanted to do was look for visibly damaged capacitors. They're usually bulging, leaking, or split on top, but I don't see anything. They all seem to be in pretty good condition. The dials are filthy, so let's try removing some of that dust with a brush. But the thing that is probably causing the weird pattern is a bad contact of the variable resistor itself. So I'm going to apply some deoxid to each of them and then spin them back and forth a few times to clean them and hopefully get reliable contact. I cleaned the inside of the case and that's looking a lot better already. And here you can see the transformer and the two connectors. One of them is for the switch and the other one is for the two sets of AC voltages that get rectified in the board. While cleaning the outside of the case, I noticed that there's this number written in what looks to be like a gold marker. I wonder what that is. It doesn't look like a date. And it doesn't match the serial number of the computer or the monitor. Just alcohol doesn't look enough to remove it. So I'm going to try a trick that I've used in the past with success. And that is to draw on top of it with a marker and then remove the marker with alcohol. But wow. I don't know what marker they use, but that stuff is not going away even with that trick. All right, you know what? It's fine. It's at the back and I won't be seeing it, so I'm gonna leave it alone in there. The cords were also pretty filthy, so I give them a careful clean all over to remove the dust and some remnants of what seemed to be white paint. Time to assemble the monitor back so I can test it. I already put the main board back, now the 12 volt board, the cables connecting it to a transformer, and let's not forget the CRT anode. Okay, all set, let's test it. Let's turn it on and see. Okay, so far no explosions, that's always good. Let's see if we have five volts. Yep, that looks good. And now for checking the 12 volts, I'll use the barrel jack again. And yeah, it looks like we have power now. So at least I fixed that part correctly. <laughs> let's connect the computer next and make sure we still have an image. Okay, yeah, that's looking good. And if I test the dials, yes, no weird pattern on the screen and they work great, smooth as butter. I'm sure it's working since we're getting 12 volts, but let's test the floppy disk drive. And yeah, it looks like it's working great. However, the jitter is still there, which honestly, I'm not surprised since I didn't do anything to fix it and it's not like removing the dust was going to help. Since the capacitors looked fine, I'm thinking there may not be anything wrong with the monitor and it's just caused by an external factor. One possibility is that this is caused by feeding 60 Hz AC voltage into the monitor instead of 50 Hz, which is what it expects. You would think that doesn't matter because the voltage is immediately rectified and then the monitor uses DC voltage internally. But I suppose there may be a slight interference. Maybe the filtering capacitors were picked with 50 Hz in mind and 60 Hz adds enough of a ripple somewhere to cause that. But it could also be something else too, so let's try a few things first to be sure. And this is kind of embarrassing because I really should have tried this before. It's possible that the transformer itself is causing the interference with the monitor, especially since I have it right next to it. So I'm going to place it as far as I can and test it again. And I still see the jitter, so that wasn't it. Now let's use a separate 5 volt supply for the computer to make sure the interference doesn't come from there. Well, this particular power supply adds a lot of noise to the image, like I mentioned in a previous video, but the jitter is still there, so that's not where it's coming from, and this is definitely not an improvement. And finally, let's try using a different computer. I'll use an Amstrad CPC 464, and I still see the jitter there, so it's definitely coming from the monitor, not the computer itself. A lot of you probably know that Adrian, over at Adrian's Digital Basement, is quite the CRT expert. So I talked to him a bit about this case, and he actually suggested converting the whole monitor to run on DC voltage. At first, I was pretty surprised, but it is true that the main monitor functions run on just 12 volts DC, so that could be really interesting. I wonder how many amps it requires, though. It could be an interesting conversion using something like a Meanwell power supply, and that way we get both the 12 volts for the monitor and 5 volts for the computer, and externally it will be exactly the same, so that could be a very interesting future upgrade. I'm very glad how the monitor turned out. Now, this is really nice and usable. And this was actually a great warm up to fix this completely dead monitor at a future date. Now, if you excuse me, it's time to enjoy and relax with the Amstrad. See you next time.